So hi everyone, uh, my name is Michel, and today I'd like to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is Bitcoin. So I guess most of you have probably heard about Bitcoin somewhere, uh, probably only few understand what it actually is. Uh, but one thing is pretty certain, and it is that many people have very strong opinions of it. So it is part of human nature that we like to think in categories. Um, and essentially enjoy the comfort of a black and wo uh, white worldview. And I'm certainly guilty of that as well. Um, but in Bitcoin, this phenomenon seems to be even more pronounced. So on the one hand, does that actually work? There you go. So on the one hand, you have enthusiastic supporters who think that Bitcoin is going to become the world's dominant currency. And essentially also think that Bitcoin is a solution to pretty much any problem you can imagine. Um, and so this group sometimes displays a sort of cultish behavior that can take on almost religious dimensions. Um, then on the other hand, you have fervent Bitcoin critics uh, who tirelessly try to stress the point that Bitcoin is either criminal, that uh, or only used by criminals, that it's a scam, or that it's an environmental disaster which is directly contributing to climate change. And what's interesting about those skeptics is that actually they show a similar level of passion and conviction when they criticize Bitcoin. And so that makes me really wonder how come that Bitcoin, this magic internet money, really provokes such strong emotions um, and essentially even people love it or hate it. Now, let's take a step back and actually explore what Bitcoin really is. So Bitcoin is an electronic payment system that allows you to send money to anyone in the world. Now that's not very exciting in itself because we can already do that with PayPal or Visa. But unlike these systems, Bitcoin doesn't require you to open an account. So Bitcoin is an open and permissionless system, which essentially means that you do not have to ask anyone for permission in order to use it. And so because Bitcoin doesn't rely on intermediaries, transactions and payments cannot be easily censored or blocked and also user accounts cannot be temporarily frozen as is the case in conventional payment systems and one thing that's also fundamentally different about bitcoin is that it has no national currencies so there are no euros pounds or dollars on the system but instead it has its own natively digital assets which is maybe sometimes confusingly also called bitcoin and so what's interesting about that asset is that it is not issued or controlled by a central bank, a financial institution, or any corporation. But instead, it is directly created by a decentralized network according to a predetermined and auditable schedule that fixes the total supply to 21 million coins. And now these digital coins, if they are properly stored, are actually very difficult to seize or confiscate. And that puts users back into control. Now, all of that sounds pretty great, doesn't it? But, of course, there's a catch to it. So, as with most things in life, um, there is no free lunch, and Bitcoin is really no different in that regard. So, all of these properties that I just described come at a rather high cost. So, first, we have the Bitcoin network, which is really composed of tens of thousands of computers and servers all around the world. And all of these participants, which are called nodes, are essentially verifying every single transaction that goes through the system. And then they store a copy. So each of these nodes stores a copy of the entire transaction history. So every single transaction that has ever happened and all future transactions that will happen. And they will store that copy forever. So while that, of course, makes it harder to shut down the system, I think we can all agree that this is a very inefficient way to run a global payment system. And then, of course, there's also Bitcoin mining. So mining is a way to essentially process transactions in a decentralized fashion so that you don't have to rely on a central authority or intermediary. And so you can think of it as a sort of lottery that takes place every 10 minutes and where the holder of the winning ticket uh, gets awarded with newly created Bitcoins. However, these lottery tickets aren't cheap. So, in fact, they require significant upfront investments uh, in terms of specialized hardware and equipment, as depicted here in this picture. And, of course, these machines also require a lot of electricity in order to run 24-7. And when I say a lot of electricity, I really mean it. Um, so, at Cambridge, we have developed an online tool uh, that estimates 
how much electricity Bitcoin is actually consuming. And so according to that index, right now, Bitcoin consumes about 79 terawatt hours of electricity on a yearly basis. So to put this into perspective, this is roughly equivalent to the yearly electricity consumption of Belgium, which is a developed country with a population of 11 million. So that's pretty mind-blowing, isn't it? And especially if you consider that Bitcoin can only process a lousy five transactions per second, which is really peanuts compared to other systems like Visa, who routinely do more than 2,000 transactions per second. But I think at this point it's worth remembering that Bitcoin has been specifically designed to facilitate the payments and transactions that you couldn't do with systems like Visa or PayPal. So what kind of payments are these? Let me give you some examples. So many people in developing countries lack basic access to international payment rails and systems, which means that they are effectively excluded from participating in the global economy. And so Bitcoin enables freelancers all over the world, so whether they're based in Bangladesh, in um, North Korea, or in Nigeria, for example, to essentially globally expand their user base and customer base and actually generate additional income for themselves and their family, and all of that without necessarily having a bank account. This picture here shows a street in Venezuela, which is littered with worthless Bolivar notes where essentially the money isn't even worth the paper it's printed on. And so Venezuela has been suffering for quite a few years now from hyperinflation, which has had disastrous impacts on the population and small businesses. So most people do not have uh, access to a foreign bank account, and strict capital controls also make it difficult to actually get foreign currency such as a US dollar. And so in this environment, what we can increasingly observe is that a growing number of especially uh, middle-class citizens increasingly hold a significant portion of their wealth in Bitcoin, which they often receive from abroad, from relatives that live there, and then only spend part of that uh, converting it back to Bolivars whenever they need to do um, basic, so to shop for groceries or basic necessities. And that provides them at least with a partial way to escape hyperinflation. And I'm pretty sure all of you know this organization, WikiLeaks, so in late 2010, after uh, releasing secret diplomatic cables and also footage of U.S. war crimes in the Middle East, um, WikiLeaks was hit by a state-imposed banking blockade, which James Ball from the Bureau of, uh, the Bureau of General and Investigative Journalism actually called a sinister attack on free speech. And so under the pressure of the U.S. government, payment service providers like PayPal and Visa were forced to shut down WikiLeaks accounts and to hold all payments. But WikiLeaks actually managed to sustain operations by starting to accept donations over the Bitcoin network. And according to this tweet from 2017, it seems to have paid off rather well. So when Bitcoin started to skyrocket up to $20,000 per coin, well, WikiLeaks essentially made a 50,000% return on their Bitcoin holdings. Now, Bitcoin's open and permissionless nature also lends itself to, let's say, less desirable uses. So it is no secret really that Bitcoin is a popular payment method on online black markets. So this is a screenshot from Silk Road, which used to be a very popular darknet market that allowed users to buy any sorts of illicit drugs, weapons, forged ID cards, and stolen credit cards. Um, now, while Silk Road has been shut down since, dozens of new sites have popped up on the dark web and essentially play a cat and mouse game with, lo uh, with law enforcement and authorities. And I hope that none of you had the unpleasant experience of seeing a window like this pop up on your computer screen that actually tells you, oops, all your files have been encrypted. So these so-called ransomware attacks actually hijack your computer on the internet, and then they encrypt its entire disk, which means that you cannot access your files anymore. Now, the only way to regain access to your files is to pay a ransom to the attackers in Bitcoin. And then, if you're lucky, the attacker will send you a decryption key so that you gain access to the files again. And the irreversible nature of Bitcoin payments and its semi-anonymity, or what we call pseudo-anonymity, actually make this attack uh, pretty popular for criminals, much to the dismay of many internet users and businesses. 
And so Bitcoin doesn't all, also only allow oppressed citizens to circumvent uh, authoritarian regimes, but it also allows these very regimes and their corrupt officials to bypass official sanctions, embargoes, and other restrictions. So sanctioned countries like um, Iran, like North Korea, like Venezuela, are all uh, thought to be using Bitcoin as a way to bypass these international sanctions. And so also let's not forget that in various instances, criminals have been using Bitcoin for money laundering. And in a few new examples where terrorist organizations have actually tried to use Bitcoin for fundraising. Although thankfully, uh, so far with rather limited success. So I hope you can now appreciate a little bit better why Bitcoin um, provokes such strong emotions and strongly divergent opinions. Now, since the beginning of this talk, one new block has been added to the Bitcoin blockchain. It took millions of mining machines, more than 65 sextillion lottery tickets in order to find that block. So that's 65 with a number followed by 21 zeros in order to find just that very block. It also took more than 1,500 megawatt hours of electricity to produce this block. And so just for reference, with that same amount of electricity, you could power on average 300 UK households for more than a year. Now, one lucky miner has been rewarded with 12.5 Bitcoin for finding this very block, which is roughly equivalent to $100,000 at current prices. And this block contains thousands of transactions from all over the world. So one of these transactions may represent a donation to a persecuted human rights group in an authoritarian country. And yet another of these transactions may represent a criminal that is just cashing out his ransomware proceeds. So essentially the point I want to make here is that Bitcoin is an open permissionless platform. And that also means that it can be used by bad actors for nefarious purposes. So if you were to only allow good users, that would require to establish some sort of authority that would have to determine what's good and what's bad. And now the issue with that is that laws and morals evolve over time and often at distinct paces in different geographies. So what do private possession of gold, the consumption of alcohol and conducting abortions all have in common? Well, they all used to be illegal in the US at some point. And even today, massive discrepancies still exist. So, for example, homosexuality is still considered a crime in many places in the world, and many countries severely restrict uh, free speech and the freedom of the press. And so, in contrast to that, Bitcoin really has no notion of justice or morals. And that is really a fundamental prerequisite for achieving its key value proposition, which is being a neutral value transfer system. And so with that, I'd actually like to go back to the original question of the talk. So is Bitcoin good or bad in itself? And I would actually say it's neither. It simply is, and that is more than enough. Thank you.